Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're getting going on a brand new teaching series called Transforming Love. Looking at the various ways that we are made new or transformed by the love of God. And we're doing this series because we have a mission statement in this church, which is to reach Tamworth with the life transforming love of Christ. And of course, in order to reach anyone with anything, we have to understand it first. It's no good trying to share the love of Christ with someone if we don't know what it is or what it does in our own lives, is it? So last week we looked at the heart. We spoke of the importance of making sure that we are operating from a place of love. Sometimes Christianity is seen as this religion that's all about following commandments or rules but as we saw from Jesus challenging words in Matthew 5 God is far more interested in what's going on in here <clears throat> in fact Jesus said that the law and the various instructions given through the prophets they all hang on just two commandments love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself for a Christian Love is our highest calling because God is love and whoever lives in love lives in God. This week, then, we're going to take a look at how God transforms our mind. Now, some might argue, at least in a metaphorical sense, that the heart and the mind are kind of the same thing. I tend to think of the heart as my sort of emotional driver, whereas my brain, my mind is my reasoning and logic such as it is. Interestingly, though, in ancient times, they thought of the heart as, what, as the place you got reason and logic and the bowels or lower functions of your body as the seat of emotion, perhaps because there tends to be a bit more urgency down there if you catch my drift. For example, a literal translation of Psalm 16, 7 is, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my kidneys instruct me. And when Jesus had compassion on the crowds, what it actually says is that Jesus was moved to his inner being or even his bowels. Thank goodness we have translators who can update the metaphors for us. Otherwise, we might end up with a very confusing religion. Although worship songs might be more fun. Open the eyes of my intestinal tract has quite a different ring to it, doesn't it? But anyway. What we're talking about today is what's going on up here and the way in which we are transformed by the love of God in our thinking, in our mind. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul says this. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And Paul is actually a wonderful example of someone who was transformed by the love of God. He went from being Jesus' biggest critic even taking it upon himself to hunt down his followers and throw them in prison to referring to himself as a slave of Christ and writing some of the most profound verses in all of scripture, such as his infamous words on love, read at nearly every wedding since. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud and so on and so on. But the thing that I really appreciate about Paul is that he didn't find it easy. His transformation didn't just occur overnight. God didn't switch a flip, flick a switch in his brain and then suddenly he was a changed man. No, no, it required some some work. For example, it took him over 17 years before he was even really ready to get going with the work that God had called him to. Three years in Syria and 14 in Turkey, learning this new way of living. Read about it in Galatians 1 and 2. And even then, he didn't have an easy time of it. In 2 Corinthians, he writes, In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, we're not told exactly what that thorn was, but it would seem that it was something that played on his mind constantly. And despite his prayers, it never went away. You know, not everything that we ask for healing for, at least in this life, is taken away from us. He struggled in other ways, too. In Romans, he says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but I hate what I do. And later he adds, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. He <laughs> was a tad dramatic at times as well. But he understood that the Christian life, it's not a constant victory parade. You know, sometimes it's really, really hard. And yet he also wrote, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is he a bit schizophrenic? No. He was human. But he also understood that there was a tension that exists in the Christian life. A tension between the ultimate victory that we have in Jesus, won for us at the cross, and the life that we currently lead. He even wrote, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I am known in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so he has this, this awareness that the transformation that comes through the love of God it's a process. It takes time. And what I'm interested in today is the mental shifts that he made in order to help him live in the victory of Christ rather than continue to see himself as this wretched man. And I've identified three for you. I'm not saying this is it or this is all that he did. But these are three things that I've noticed that I think might help us transform our minds. So firstly, Paul made sure that he moved from pity to praise. Anyone a fan of a pity party? I think we all like a bit of pity from time to time, don't we? I mean, it feels nice when others gather around us and put their arms on our shoulders and tell us that it's going to be OK. And sometimes we really need that. We really do. But I also think there's a danger of us becoming fixated on feeling sorry for ourselves. Sometimes we can end up weaving this web of woe that ensnares others around us into becoming responsible for making us feel better. I'm talking about um, like that sort of stuff that you see on social media sometimes where people create these posts that are designed to generate pity. Oh, my life is so hard. Why does this always happen to me? Oh, it could only happen to me. And again, I'm not talking about those with genuine needs, but rather those who have become addicted to the drama. Those who have become perhaps obsessed with their own problems. They've come to believe that they are the only ones who suffer or at least that they suffer more than anybody else because Pity can be addictive. And if we're not careful, it can have this catastrophic impact on our mental health. If we allow ourselves to remain in that place of constant complaint, it can be really damaging for our minds. You know, there's a big difference between self-compassion and pity. Self-compassion is about being kind to yourself, perhaps even letting others carry you when times are tough. But pity is about feeling sorry for yourself. And it's about wanting to bring others down to your level, bring others to where you are. And I think that Paul discovered that the antidote to pity was praise. I mean, let's be honest, if anyone had a good excuse for pity, it was probably the Apostle Paul. 
I mean, not at first, because he was just that guy who used to put people in prison. No one really liked him. But throughout his life and his ministry, man, did this guy have some tough times. You know, he was put in prison himself. Okay, maybe he deserved that one. But he was also flogged, stoned, beaten with rods, shipwrecked on three separate occasions, lost at sea, exiled, lied about, persecuted, repeatedly taken to court and even bitten by a snake. I mean, you can sort of imagine his Facebook feed, can't you? Currently trying to stay afloat. Just lost another boat. Oh, why does it always happen to me? Just got beaten by rods. Happy Monday. But, you know, you can't actually find those posts anywhere on Paul's Facebook feed. And it's not just because Facebook didn't exist back then. It's because Paul had this attitude of praise. He said, we boast in the hope of the glory of God, but we also glory in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character, hope. Paul knew that the difficulties he faced, as tough as they were, they would not be forever. In fact, he calls them his light and momentary troubles. He said, I'm not going to fix my eyes on what's seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And the thing is, If we remain in that place of pity, then all we see is our suffering. But when we move to a place of praise, it reminds us of who God is. It reminds us of his promises to us and his faithfulness and love. It allows us to gain this entirely new perspective, to know that this is not the end. This isn't the way it will always be. I love Psalm 13 for this reason. It starts in a place of pity. How long, Lord? How Long will you forget me forever? How long must I I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have this this sorrow in my heart? But it ends in a place of praise. The psalmist says, I trust your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing of the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Pity to praise. That's a helpful mental shift for our transformation. The second thing that I noticed is that Paul tends to go from belittlement to belief. Now, this is an interesting one because belittlement can come at us from all sorts of different angles. Sometimes it comes in the form of words that have been spoken to us or perhaps said about us. And James reminds us of the power of words, doesn't he? He likens the tongue to a a tiny spark that sets a great forest ablaze. And sometimes the words that have been spoken over us, even in our youth, can still hold power in our lives. They can keep us in cages of self-doubt and deprecation. And I've said this many times before, but we have to be so careful about the words that we use, especially with children, because words can come to define the entire course of our lives. The child is told that they're brilliant, capable and bright and and worthy of love, then they will grow up in that light. But if they're told that they're worthless, pathetic and dull, unwanted, then they will come to believe it. I think maybe it's one of the reasons Jesus got so angry with the disciples when they tried to keep the children away from him, as though they were somehow unworthy of his love. But the other way that belittlement comes into our lives is through comparison. When we look at other people and find those reasons to disqualify ourselves, concluding that they are perhaps better looking or better dressed or more articulate or funnier or kinder or cleverer or fitter or whatever it might be. And so there must be something wrong with us. And again, I don't want to make this all about the evils of social media, but I think this is a proper killer for this. Now, even when we're lying in bed in our own homes, we can still scroll through our phones and see how much more fun everyone else is having than us. Comparison is constantly around us and comparison very easily leads to belittlement. But I think that Paul discovered the antidote to belittlement in belief. 
You know, he suffered a lot of criticism in his day, not just from his enemies, but from followers of Jesus as well. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he writes, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. You've got to love those quotation marks there. And then later he says, for some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Poor Paul. Essentially what was happening here was that the church that he founded had had other leaders who were more charismatic, had better sermon illustrations, told funnier jokes, went to the gym, hung out with celebrities, whatever. And Paul was suffering by comparison. But he didn't let it get to him. Instead, he chose to trust and to believe the work that God was doing through him. In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, what after all is Apollos? That was one of those fancy other preachers. And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And in Philippians 4, he writes, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. See, Paul refused to accept others assessment of him or even compare himself to others because he knew who he belonged to. He knew he was in God's hands. He knew he was chosen by him and called to his purposes. And nothing could ever change that. Nothing could take that away from him. And that's true for us, too. That's the belief that we need to carry in our minds to help us move away from belittlement. But, you know, it can swing the other way. Which brings me to my final mental shift, because I also think that Paul decided to go from ego to eternity. Maybe it's the case that you don't suffer from pity or belittlement, but you do suffer from a rather big head. <laughs> I think when I was younger, I was much more prone to self-doubt. But the older I've got and the more comfortable I've become with myself, I've started to find self-aggrandizing more of a temptation than self-deprecation. I'm not sure which is worse yet, but I suspect the latter. And, you know, it doesn't even take that much. Like if just a couple of people tell me through the week that they appreciate me or think I'm wonderful, I'm not going to lie. There's a little bit of a pep in my step. There's a bit of a, a swagger in my walk. When I go into a room, I expect the atmosphere to change just because of my presence. But just like there's a difference between self-compassion and pity, there's also a difference between self-confidence and ego. Self-confidence says, I can do this. I, I know that I'm capable. I, I believe in myself. Ego says, I'm better than everyone else. Everyone should look to me. I think there's a particular danger of this in churches where the pastor is seen as the most important figure over and above everyone else, even Jesus. And that was a temptation for Paul as well. When he was in Lystra in Acts 14, he healed a man and the crowd saw what happened and they, they tried to worship Paul as a god. They called Barnabas and Paul Zeus and Hermes and they, they tried to make sacrifices to them. And Paul ended up tearing his clothes and said, friends, why are you doing this? We're only human, just like you. Paul was very careful to keep a right view of himself, to not let praise and adoration go to his head. He knew that everything he had was by the grace of God. And so he chose to keep his eyes fixed on eternity. Listen to what he wrote to Timothy. He said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, 
the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He didn't let his ego distract him from eternity, the mission that God had called him to. So let me try and draw things to a close. Paul is this wonderful example of someone who was transformed by the love of God. But that doesn't mean that he didn't continue to struggle. He told us not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But in order to do that, in order to think differently, we perhaps have to make some mental shifts, change some ways of thinking, avoid some pitfalls. We can't allow our circumstances to become the things that define us. So we need to make sure that our pity doesn't outweigh our praise. We need to keep our eyes fixed on God. We also need to have a right view of ourselves. One where we're not constantly comparing ourselves to others, but are secure in the knowledge of God's calling in our lives. We need to move from belittlement to belief. But we also need to remember that it is by his love and grace alone that we have this life. As Paul writes, we are jars of clay to show that this treasure, this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. And so we reject our ego in favour of eternity. So may your mind be transformed by the love of God. May you come to realise that despite things being difficult right now, the ultimate victory is yours in Christ. May you know that you are loved beyond measure and that God has a plan and a purpose that is uniquely yours. May you come to let go of your own ego long enough to take hold of all that God has for you in this life.